Hey everyone, Phil from Ember Prototypes here. So, I've been tasked with printing some fairly large, dense carbon fiber nylon molds for a matched dye thermoforming application. Anyways, I've tried printing the parts on our stock Bamboo Lab X1C, making sure that everything was preheated, the build chamber would get as hot as it could be still experiencing some warp, which is unfortunate. So I'm going to try adding a heater into the system using all off-the-shelf parts. I don't want to mess around with having to build my own system. If I can mod something with off-the-shelf components, I totally will. So we've got this little PTC heater off of Amazon. I think it's a 200 watt or 500 watt uh, small heater and this should fit right on the left side here, right next to the auxiliary fan. And then I've got a Inkbird temperature controller with a temperature sensor to help close the loop for thermal control. And then I've just got a little AC timer. Um, I know that each half of the mold takes around five hours to print, and so I'm just gonna set this for six hours so it turns off. I don't wanna leave this thing running indefinitely just for safety reasons. Uh, I'd normally use like an IoT switch or something, but I just don't have one lying around, so this will do. And yeah, let's start off by opening this up and just see what's inside of it, and then I'll document the process of modding the printer and seeing if it works. So this is the heater, pretty straightforward. This fan, there's a PTC element here. Classic screw holes being covered by some kind of sticker, but that never stopped anybody from getting into some electronics, did they? So we're just gonna take this apart. All right, and we're in. Power plug, there's a fuse here. We've got a button. We've got a bridge rectifier, it seems like, right? That chip there. And then a giant capac and a couple of capacitors. Ah, here we go. So this is the PTC element. So it looks like it's in some kind of injection molded enclosure. You can tell that this is like a glass filled polymer. So something with really high heat resistance because you can kind of see by the sheen of this plastic, that's like a immediate telltale for a glass filled polymer. And then this is actually what I was most interested in looking at. Um, this is a bimetallic switch. So this is essentially a thermal fuse. Uh, so these will typically be rated for some temperature. I don't think they specify exactly what temperature protection this has, uh, but I wanted to know if this had any kind of protection in it. So how these work is this guy here is a switch. So right now you can see that the contacts are closed but as the temperature increases over time, there's actually a bimetallic strip here. And so what happens is thermal expansion is going to eventually cause this to shrink and break the, the switch here. So this is essentially a reversible thermal fuse. If, it, if for some reason this is overheating, then this guy will disconnect and then once it cools back down, then it will reconnect. So that's a nice safety feature. I wanted to make sure there was some safety feature in here. So pretty straightforward, uh, really nice compact design. You can see the impeller here, brings in air through this guy and then shoots it out vertically. So I'm, yeah, it looks like a centrifugal fan but they made their own, which is kind of cool, actually. 
I guess it's cheaper. All right, so now that we've checked that there is some kind of thermal protection, let's try hooking it up into our X1C. We'll have it running on a closed thermal loop with that Inkbird temperature controller. It's not gonna be super accurate, but it's gonna be good enough. Um, if this overheats, this thermal fuse should switch off. And then also if anything goes wrong, we have it running on a timer for six hours and I'll be around to make sure nothing bad happens. Also, let's get rid of this damn sticker. It's bothering me so much. Oh no, no. Oh my God. That's the worst. That is the absolute worst. Oh, all right, I guess we'll have to clean that. Turns out that I don't have to clean it because we're gonna just press this button and leave it on all the time. And this is gonna face the wall of the printer. So whatever. So we're probably going to put this guy here it's kind of the perfect spot to be honest and then run the cables down here and then through the either similarly how we have it here where you know we've got our carbon filter we run it through back through the poop chute and then it actually just goes out through the back panel and we we just don't have the back panel fully fastened uh we'll probably do something like that i just need to be careful that this wherever we put the wires it doesn't clip the plate when it's moving So we've got our, our cables and stuff ready to go. Let's flip this back around and try assembling everything together. Because I want to see what the thermal performance is, I've actually hooked up a small thermocouple logger that I made many years ago. Um, and I'm gonna acquire some data and log it to a CSV file so I can plot it later. So I have three thermocouples hooked up. There's one on the left at the top, there's one on the extruder head, and then there's one by the door here. Just to give an idea on the discrepancy of temperature readings, right now we've got our heater on, we're printing 
carbon fiber nylon and the machine is reading 52 degrees. But then if we look down at our temperature controller, it's around 62 degrees. We have it set at 65, um, but it's reading around 62 degrees. The thermocouple readings we had before were even higher. From a practical perspective, once the hot air goes around and it like, there's heat loss and there's conduction and everything through all the parts, uh, your effective average temperature is actually lower. But anyways, just kind of interesting that this discrepancy exists. I wonder if the temperature sensor for the chamber is actually just in the electronics at the back, like on a PCB, because if that's the case, then that temperature reading is going to be lower than the temperature inside the actual chamber. But our heated chamber is working pretty well. And it was really easy to install, so I'm pretty happy with it. There's our mold. It looks pretty good. No warping at all. So it seems like after making some geometry changes and using the heated build chamber, the part came out pretty good. Okay, so that's how we modified our X1C to have a heated build chamber. It's pretty cool to finally have, you know, an easy, low-cost machine with a heated build chamber in it. Um, I think it'll definitely help with big, dense parts, ABS, polycarbonate, clearly carbon fiber nylon helps. So hopefully that was interesting and I'll link all the components down in the description below so that you can also do this modification if you want yourself. So give this video a like, subscribe if you enjoyed it, uh, leave a comment down below if you want to have a discussion, and as always, thanks for watching.